Did you grow up in Canada? Were you alive in the 90s? Did you love YTV? Fuck yeah, you did! Welcome back to the show that gives Canadian 90s nostalgia the respect it deserves. Today we have superstar Jamie Elman, so sit back, strap in as we entertain the crap out of you on You, Me, and YTV, starting now. Oh, and by the way, the guy drawing the pictures, that's me. I asked the dear audience members if they had any questions for you because, uh, you know, you were somewhat of a dreamboat to most of them. So I asked that's, all the... That's sad. So I asked all the chicks. That's very... That's... <laughs> that's okay, thank you. And uh, one of them was asking, what was your real high school experience like comparatively to the fake one you had mm. on, that you got paid for? Right. Um, it's a good question. Thank you, whoever said that. Um... I had a good time in high school, but not nearly as good as time that I had in fake Edison High School. It's an awkward time <laughs> in people's lives. When I did the show, I was in my early 20s, and it was a less awkward time. I did a lot of the high school plays, and um, that sort of became my thing. And I got in with a good group of friends by doing the, the high school plays and the musicals, and uh, including one when I was in grade 10, The Pajama Game, where I played opposite Lisa Rubin, who is the director of the play Bad Jews, also the artistic and executive director of this theater, the Siegel Center. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't a painful, terrible, miserable time. It was probably, you know, average to above average, I would say. But uh, I certainly was not the dreamboat, if that, if that, I think that's the word you used. Um, <laughs> cool. Cody. Cody. Way to go, man. I didn't know you had it in you. I certainly never felt like that. Um, I had a girlfriend through uh, uh, the last couple of years. Um, being in the plays was not the cool thing to do. Um, I don't know. The cool thing to do in, in my high school was the fashion show. Any of the cool kids that took the drama classes, hmm. or as I called them at the time, drama classes, um, we're, we're just trying to get easy A's and maybe, you know, meet some chicks or something. Not that I wasn't trying to do that, but I did genuinely love, you know, doing the plays and theater. And we did the play Play It Again, Sam, uh, by Woody Allen. That was my first exposure to Woody Allen and changed my life. And, you know, getting comfortable on stage and, and doing those shows and singing ended up being very sort of pivotal and like fundamental to my training and wanting to do it. But it, I, you know, it was still high school and I'm sure there was still plenty of angst and uh, misery and breakups and, you know, depression and peer pressure and, you know, all the usual stuff. Um, so getting to go back to high school when I was like 21, you know, with the show was... It was like the dream, it was like a wish fulfillment of, you know, even though Cody had angst and all that stuff too. And a Chris. And, 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 and Chris. <laughs> and, I mean, but we, we had such a good time doing it. And there were elements, it, it felt like being in high school because unlike a lot of other sitcoms, including I think Radioactive and um, Big Wolf on Campus that was shooting here at the time, um, or Breaker High, we were really shooting in an actual high school in the east end of Montreal, in Rosemont. They converted it, like they rented it from the government and basically converted it sort of into sound stages where they would insulate the classrooms for sound and they turned, you know, half the cafeteria into Cody's father's house or the gym was the station. Or, but we were in an actual high school when we were shooting in classrooms, we were in classrooms. You know, there was sort of a fourth wall thing the way we were shooting multiple cameras, but it was in a high school and it made, it, it brought out the real immaturity in all of us, which I, I think was good. Speaking of uh, immaturity and friendship and all that, mm -hmm. um, someone you may have heard of named Ross Hall, mm -hmm. um, I asked him about, uh, hey, what should I ask Jamie when he gets on the show? And he said, uh, how did the real life friendships that you guys forged influence the chem on-screen chemistry? Oh, yeah, well, first of all, speaking of immature, Ross Hall. Hey, Ross. Well, in any series, I think, that, you know, ends up going for a while, like we shot 65 episodes, there's what the writers imagine before you cast the thing. Mm. And then the cast comes in, and maybe they have the first few scripts ready, but then the writers know you, and they start writing 
to the characters, the, the, the real life characters, the, the, the personas, and to the real chemistry. I could think of a few examples here, maybe, but, um, uh, you know, Victor was played by Mick Perlis. As editor of The Voice, I only care about one thing making you and your friends' lives miserable. <laughs> Au revoir, mon cherry. <laughs> and he was sort of something of a two-dimensional kind of bad guy um, in the first season, but we, we became best friends, and, 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 you know, we hung out together, and all, all, all the guys were hanging out, and so, you know, he, he inevitably had to become sort of involved with us more in a more friendly way and then as the show went on you know the, the writers even wrote an episode that uh, Mick and I pitched to them because uh, Mick and I lived together that's fascinating yeah we we, we, we moved in together for a summer um, and just you know partied and whatever we did while we were shooting we became very close friends and we just thought it would be so ridiculous to have Cody and, and we just wanted to be in, in more scenes together and act out our real stupidity of life on the show so we pitched Joe and Paul the the writers and they they wrote us an episode where Victor moves in for some reason <laughs> for an episode and it was one of our favorite episodes to do just because we we were such good friends at that time and we were just goofing around and having fun and um, I, that probably is a good example of things that happened all throughout the cast and and the way that they ended up writing for us <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, buddy. <laughs> Get out. Whoa. No need to be testing. Get out. Get out now. Upon, you know, knowing I was interviewing you, I was looking at some highlight episodes mm -hmm. uh, that I remember near and dear to my heart. And uh, definitely one of them was the episode where all of a sudden Victor finally became your friend was the road trip. Yes. Where everything went to hell, and then Victor started to be coming in on the jokes, and then by the end. Well, yeah, after we fixed the car, he passed this blues club that Victor knew about, and he convinced us to go. You guys went to a place Victor recommended. Best bands you've ever heard. This goes to show what a great actor I think Mick is, is that literally they're like, hey, you know what, man, you're actually pretty cool. He's like, hmm, I'll try not to, I'll try to contain my excitement. And when everyone's back was turned, he said, <laughs> You, my friend, are on the cutting edge. Yeah. You want a bus now? <laughs> yeah, I'll try to contain my excitement. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. I forgot about that. And uh, that, and that kind of tugged on my heartstring. I'm like, now they're buddies. The four of us, me, Mick, Mark, and Ross, we shared a dressing room, first of all. So it's like very glamorous. I don't know what people think it is, but um, they took one of the classrooms and put like cardboard dividers in, I, I, I don't know, plywood, I don't know what, what it was, but the four of us shared a dressing room, which was a classroom. Mm. And so every morning we'd come in and, you know, you're, you're, you're like on top of each other in this little space and we became very good friends, the four of us, very fast. And obviously we were going through an experience that was very special and we knew that it was special as it was happening. We were so lucky that we had jobs and regular you know, paychecks and steady work and, mm. and that it was like a fun job to come to. And so we became friends pretty fast. And I, don't, I can't imagine they would have imagined that episode until they saw how the four of us were together. And so they wanted to put the four of us together in an episode where we could just be the guys and, you know, do that thing. So, and yes, he was great. Mick, all right, there, I said it. You were great. Um... Uh, they all were, so the, the camaraderie off camera lent itself to episodes like that. And it's actually interesting what a, you know, humble, quiet guy you are in person. But on screen, they kept throwing you in situations where you were the cute one. <laughs> um, basically, what was it like for those couple of years? Because your viewers were younger viewers, you know, possibly in high school and under. Um, the girls that would come up to you who were like 12, 13, 12 years old, they saw you in public. They're like, oh, my God, it's Cody from Student and Bodies. And then, you know, you're like, that's cool. And then 10 years later, it's just like they're these insanely hot 23-year-olds. They're like... Hey, you're Cody from Student Bodies. Yeah, um, an astute question. Mm. Right, very good, very yeah. good. 
Uh, well, here's the good news. First of all, well, what was the f- what is the dream I never had like? Oh, okay, That's okay. Yeah, yeah. It's probably not as good <laughs> as you hope it is, yeah. but it's better than most dreams or something. I, yeah. I, I, I don't know. Look, I mean, I'm being stupid. I, I, <laughs> it's all good. Uh, well, first of all, the first season of the show we were shooting in Montreal. The I, I was living here in the off season. I was going to McGill, and uh, I was basically completely unaware of the audience or the audience reaction because like I was going to university and it was on I guess maybe once a week when it first started it first started yeah Yeah. and I didn't know that people were watching it and it didn't become like a breakout hit in Montreal that I was aware of uh, both because of where I was hanging out and because it's a French city and it hadn't been dubbed into French yet which eventually it was Um, but I vaguely remember when we came back to do the second season and the whole cast um, from Toronto came into town and they were like, you got to come to Toronto. You got to see what's going on there because everybody watches the show and it's like crazy and you, you'll get recognized and <laughs> it's like a fantastic ego boost. So at some point on a break, on a weekend, I don't know why we went, we, we went out to Toronto and um, might have been after shooting the second season or during the second season. And I saw the the audience reaction in Toronto, but the by the time I got there, I think they were starting to show the show a lot. Mm. As I like to say, it's not necessarily that everybody loved it; it's that they couldn't help but see it, because it was on YTV then like daily, and it would be on in that four o'clock or three o'clock slot after high school, and so maybe there were younger high school kids watching it. But then they'd replay it at midnight and one in the morning for the stoners when they come home and then they'd watch it all you know high and stony in the middle of the night and then saturday morning the drunk people would wake up the 20 whatever young 20s and they'd watch it like hung over on saturday mornings and then saturday afternoon and sunday morning and then global started showing it not long after that and that was just on all the time so yes we had the um you know the 12 year old uh, viewers but we also had the early 20s the college crowd in toronto was watching it so for, i nothing creepy yeah ever, oh, no of course you know, no i no. wasn't insinuating yeah. that i was just yeah. wondering if the notoriety you got from women was more like you know instantaneous from older girls or was it like uh or was it like something you had to bury and wait a decade for um right like a time capsule right right yeah. um well the first of all when we'd be out uh like the four guys in toronto something would happen inevitably wherever we went, which is that the girls would all scream and go crazy for Ross. Can you, uh, all me up? <laughs> no! You're right. I'm better on natural. And literally, we could stand there, me, Mick, and Mark, and they wouldn't notice us. Okay. And they'd ask to take his picture or something, and they'd ask us to hold the camera. And it became like a running joke that whenever we go out, especially like, you know, you're talking about the road trip episode, it's like, here's the four of us, but he's the guy. It's like he's, and he was, you know, are you afraid of the dark? And he was Gary. Yeah. And he was, what's the other one, Ready or, ready or Not? Was he, oh, was that, was okay. that? Okay. I was about to say, I'm thinking it's probably because of the, the Are You Afraid of the Dark thing too, because he'd been in the Canadian consciousness of television absolutely. for a- absolutely. 10 years. And the, you know, the time capsule thing I'm talking about, it's very well that those 20-something-year-old girls were watching Are You Afraid of the Dark when they were 12. And, yes, you know, it's so- yes, and don't get me wrong. Yeah. I, uh, I hated him for it, Okay. and I still do. Okay. But uh, the, he was like the, the star of the group, really. Okay. And, um, but, the, but the funny part to me is that we wrapped the show. Mm. We finished shooting the show. In March 99, so that's about 17 years ago. Wow. Now, I still go to Toronto multiple times a year, and I was out with Mark, Mick, and Ross for dinner in um, uh, Liberty Village about two months ago. We have our uh, semi-annual boys' night road trip reunion dinner. I think that's beautiful, man. That's great. I love them. I still love them dearly. And uh, sure enough, there were some girls who really screamed and got excited. Once again, to recognize Ross, you son of a bitch. <laughs> um, I'll be calling you later to talk about this. But um, anyway, so it was the same thing. And again, they were asking us to take pictures of them now on their iPhones. And it's like nothing's changed. So, <laughs> Ross, I hope you did well with it. Chris, get out of the line. 
Well, why? What did I do? You're disqualified. How do you figure? He looks pretty darn qualified to me. I won't tell them the stories, don't Maybe worry. Maybe they're like weather groupies, though. Well, they, 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 well, not even yeah. more part of the consciousness, because he's still on TV a lot, you know, mm -hmm. but, but he was on TV a lot from when he was a little kid. So, um, look, suffice to say, because I, I, you have the right to ask these, if I were you, I would be asking me the same questions, okay? Now, this is on camera, so I can't say everything, okay? <laughs> of course. But I'll say, suffice to say, I'll say this about that, it was good. <laughs> it was good. It, 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 was, it was great to, uh, to especially, you know, because we didn't shoot in front of a live studio audience the way almost all multi-camera sitcoms do. We were, like I said, shooting in this high school uh, in a location with a mostly French-Canadian crew who maybe didn't understand the humor of the show or just didn't find us funny. So it's like we would try and we'd be on there trying to be funny and do the jokes and everything, and then they call cut, and it's like silence in the room, and there's no audience feedback, and there's no reaction. And this was kind of early internet. I'm not going to say pre-internet, but very early internet. True, yeah. So it wasn't like there was websites and fan mail. Like there was, it was just the very beginning of that. There were websites. They were just like GeoCity websites that exactly. took forever to go from one spot to another. Exactly. So like once a month or something, they would like print up a couple of fan mails that we got mm. and show us that like somebody wrote in from wherever. But it was great to suddenly be in Toronto a year into it and, and realize that people watched the show and told us anyways that they loved the show. And then even now, all these years later, here I am talking to you, people still say, you know, Cody and Emily, like I was invested in that relationship. You guys broke up, it broke me. It broke my heart, I cried myself to sleep. Why did you cheat on her, you asshole? You know, she was so good, you know, I, I, they, but I get it because I'm a, I'm a TV watcher. Yeah. I've, I've grown up on, on, on TV. I don't mean on TV, I mean watching TV. And, um, and you know, if, if you watch a show, you get invested. And um, I was very happy that I didn't realize, I hadn't realized until I got to Toronto on that first trip in the second season that people were like affected by it and were into it, you know? Well, in the tagline in the first season the first song my favorite song of the two though but uh, I understand why you guys wanted to change um, it says in your overdub at the end of the song it says it's not real life it's high school hey it's not real life it's high school now that was maybe the vibe of the first season but going into the second and third season the kids started to grow up uh -huh. and so the audience uh -huh. and you started to touch on other subjects uh -huh such as um, homosexuality, mm -hmm. such as drinking. Mm -hmm. Like a uh, mix episode where he got drunk mm -hmm. with uh, Jessica mm -hmm. Flash mm -hmm. is still uh, one of the episodes that's, you know, emotionally stayed with me. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. did. It stayed with a lot of people. Well, what I remember about this, first of all, again, astute, you know your shit. Um, uh, I don't know if I can, it's the internet, I can, this is... Fuck how, shit, okay. god damn. <laughs> I like it, I'm just, yeah. I'm just keeping it real, I'm just oh, yeah. me. Um, what I remember about the second season when we came back was that they had been testing the show, like either at YTV or at Fox, which is who produced the, the show. Really? Yeah, it was produced by 20th Century Fox. Um, That's why it had money. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And they, they were able to, well, at money, but able to spend it wisely in Canada when the, well, the, the show didn't feel Canadian. You know, some shows just feel Canadian. It, like, you guys could translate to an American audience due to the quality of even the picture. Like, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, they, they were very, you know, it was made for a U.S. audience. I think it got a lot more exposure in Canada for a variety of reasons, but the, um, the, the show is produced by Fox. They, they brought down from L.A., I guess they brought up from L.A., this director, Don Barnhart, who had directed a lot of Saved by the Bell, and this was, you know, an attempt to compete with the Saturday morning NBC lineup. So that, that's, that's why they, they had the money to do it, but they also shot it on the cheap in Montreal with the tax breaks. Still and, is Canadian. Yeah, that's yeah. right, that's right. Um, and of course the whole cast was Canadian. I think there was never any Americans that I remember on the show. 
Um, they brought in Torontonians and from other cities, but a lot of Montrealers, and it was definitely, you know, the whole crew is French-Canadian, as far as I can recall, or Quebecois, anyway, Montre- Anglo or Franco, and, and it was a Canadian show. But they, they were good at making that sort of slick package, I think. They, they had tested, like, uh, the show, and one of the comments that came back was, it was, it was uh, you know, it's not real life, it's high school, is basically condescending. Mm which I was already at a high school, I was 21 or 22 when we started, so I, I, I don't think it had ever crossed my mind or theirs. I think they just thought they were being clever, and I was like, yeah, that's, it's not real life, it's high school. And in hindsight, when you look back on high school, you're like, yeah, that's, that's five years of your life that's just this weird time, this transitional time, and you think it's, it's the be-all and end-all, but then if you're lucky, you keep living, and you go on, and then it's like, university and, and, and life and um, they didn't realize that the, I guess there was some feedback that it's, it's condescending it's babyish and so they at that point changed the second season and the credits they, they, they put on the new theme song this was also in the Friends era so it has that kind of Friends theme song yeah I noticed <laughs> I, I, I'm sure I'm sure people noticed that it had that kind of pretty surprised it didn't have like a clap after the first bar it <laughs> did it, I think didn't they uh, no wake up on the radio eight o'clock it's time to go and uh, okay that's all yeah. I, that's all I got from that studied hard to make the grade yesterday was all the same who knows what tomorrow has in store uh, but there was that kind of clappy vibe and they were trying to capture that and they took off that tagline and that I think is really like you're pointing out when the show really shifted gears like that we got through that first season they had the confidence now to try and do edgier stuff stuff that Fox was willing to do stuff that probably NBC was not willing to do I know they did some edgier stuff maybe on Saved by the Bell I didn't ever actually really watch that show but I I know they'd go down some of these things but yes like Mags wants to get breast implants, mm-hmm. and Emily has a lesbian friend, and Victor gets drunk, and Cody loses his virginity with this girl who is in an uh, 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 an art uh, uh, a, a, a nude yeah. a nude artist cla- uh, thing. Who looks like the bodies of student bodies are going to get a little sexier? Don't miss part two of Jamie Elman coming soon. He's going to talk about his new hit YouTube series, Yid Life Crisis, and give a plug to his play, Bad Jews. Don't forget to subscribe, share, and tell all your friends that 90s nostalgia is still alive on You, Me, and YTV. Go Canada! Gary was part of the Midnight Society, which, I mean, was a big part of Are You Afraid of the Dark? Of course, the actors that were part of the show were also... Oh, yeah. Well, you were part of two ensembles. Right. But, and then, you know, Jamie Elman, who played Cody in Student Bodies, would probably take issue with you saying that I starred in Student Bodies. <laughs> he had the bigger role, and, you know, all the yeah. girls liked his character, and, you know, he was the artist, so, you know, we'll have to see, but anyway. Yeah, he was a tortured artist. <laughs> yes. <laughs>